Join me to Luke 24. We're so glad to have you here at this Passion for Jesus conference. You know, when I, when I hear the subject on Passion for Jesus talked about, I'm always, or, or many times I'm directed about how Jesus inspired passion in his disciples concerning himself. In fact, we see the methodology of Jesus in his resurrected body. The resurrected Lord incites passion in the hearts of the believers by taking them on a journey concerning himself through Genesis all the way up through Malachi. This is the methodology. If you were to ask the resurrected Lord, how do you produce passion in the hearts of your disciples, especially after they've gone through the most traumatic event they've ever experienced? They've denied the Lord of glory. They've been disbanded. They think their lives are at risk by the authorities persecuting them and killing them, perhaps just like they had just killed Jesus. And when the resurrected Lord visits them, how does he inspire passion again? Knowing that every one of them, perhaps with the exception of one, John, every one of them, and even John has his day coming, of dying for the cause. They go from denial to full-blown martyrdom, passionate, praising God for the opportunity to suffer for the name of Jesus. And how does Jesus get them on board, instill them with passion, and bring them forth? From cowardice to bravery untold. From arguing over who's the greatest to fighting over who's laying down their lives. In fact, by Acts 15, you're not sure who's leading the church. They're so humble by this time, James pops on the scene and you're going, where did he come from? What's going on here? Humility pervades the hearts of the disciples. They're impassioned for Jesus. They're willing to lay down their life. How does the resurrected Lord do it? So we see in Luke 24 an example of Jesus appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he does the most honorable thing you can ever do. Look with me. You know he joins their discussion. They're disappointed. They're disillusioned. Their leader, their so thought of Messiah has been killed. Jesus sneaks up on them. And he says, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Verse 17. They answer to him, are you a stranger? Do you not know what happened? He said, what things? I just love Jesus, how he interacts. Tell me, what, what's happened? You know. <laughs> what did they do? <laughs> Tell me again, what was it like? <laughs> they said the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty and deep. Now, look how they just went down. <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought you were the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Christ, the one who's going to bring consolation to Israel. No, he's a prophet now. Mighty in word and deed. Before God and all the people and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. And all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And look what happens. As they get near to the village, he goes to leave. They ask him to come and stay with them. And as he stays with them, they go to break the bread and the, the, the cup. And as they break the bread, suddenly he's revealed. Then their eyes open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Oh, I love that. The resurrected body, he just, he's gone. 
The bread's broken. They remember the Last Supper. And suddenly their eyes are open. And now, he's gone. <laughs> Look at their statement. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Did not our heart burn? Did it not burn? Were we not apprehended by something greater than ourselves? Was not our passion ignited when he walked us through the scriptures and showed us concerning himself of his sufferings and of his entering into his glory? Beloved, I want to just invite you. This is the best methodology of training disciples that has ever ever been utilized by men and women. It's rarely ever done. I remember I got, I came into the kingdom and I got a book on basic discipleship and I started disciplines. But no one told me the story. No one painted the picture. I couldn't connect the dots and then I was thrown into a Bible that's not in chronological order. So then I was really confused going, where did, where, what just happened? How did Ruth get in here? Where did ne- Nehemiah? That's supposed to be at the end. It's way- What's going on? I couldn't figure out my way. And the more commentaries I read on individual books, the more confused I got. I wish someone who would just have taken me through the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi and told me about Jesus there. Then it would have made sense. The drama would have came alive to me on a whole nother level. I've rarely seen it ever done. And in FSM, when we take our apostolic preaching program students through this, we have hours where we can get out the whiteboard. And I say, starting with Genesis 1, let's talk about him. Why? Because you're going to preach this story one day over and over and over and over again. And not just because you're going to preach it. When you do, your heart will burn. I trust you. I, 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 trust me, it will do this. Every time we do, in that two to four to six hour, however long it takes, in that period, and we're talking the summary version, in that period, always, we end up staring at each other going, what just happened? Our hearts burning on fire. I can come in depressed I can come in frazzled. I can come in with no understanding my notes and go, okay, Scott, he went through it. I can go, Scott, Galen, tell me. Starting with Genesis 1, tell me about Jesus. And we start on the whiteboard. And we just begin to discover the beauty of Jesus as it unfolds in the Old Testament. Beloved, there is no greater acceleration of the heart on fire and love than to go from Genesis to the book of Revelation, finding Jesus on every page. Well, this morning, well, turn with me first. Turn to Acts. This morning, I want to do that. I want to do it through a certain lens, and I want to do it through a summarized version, but I want to do it. Why? Because if you start the disciplines without the story, it won't make sense to you. The drama is so important. God is the greatest storyteller there is. He loves story. He's the greatest writer, author. He's a literary genius. He's made the story to not only redeem you, but to excite you and accelerate love for him forever. Do you know a billion years from now, in the age to come, you will break out this book and you will go through it and say, tell me again. Tell me again. Jesus radio address, actually his 3D dimensional technological, however it's going to be in the millennial reign. What do they call that? Not hieroglyphics. What's that when it's on your watch or something and it pops up? Hologram. Is that what it is? This 3D hologram that's showing up in every city and every nation. Jesus wakes up in the morning and he gives the address to all the nations and he starts with Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
God said, let there be light. And he begins to expound, let there be light. And he teaches us on light, the nature of God. And Beloved, do you understand what I'm saying? In Acts chapter 1, and, and act, actually Luke 24, he opens their comprehension to understand all the scriptures, takes them on the same journey, all the disciples. And then in Acts chapter 1, I wanted to point out a verse to you because I was so impacted again by Mike's message last night. Every time I hear that, it, I, I encourage you, buy that and listen to it over and over again. And not only listen to it, put it into practice. Acts 1, verses 1 through 3, Jesus takes them on the same journey of instructing them in the kingdom, telling his commandments, but he does so through the Holy Spirit, it says. That even the resurrected Messiah is still communing forever and instructing and relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit. God in three persons forever. In Acts chapter 6, there's a certain gentleman. He's going to be the church's first martyr. In Acts chapter 6, we're told that Stephen, full of faith and power and great wonders and signs, were done among the people. It says that they were not able to resist his wisdom. And so we find out in Acts 7, he's standing before the religious leadership and we're going to find out his methodology in transmitting that wisdom. Do you know what he does? Genesis to Malachi. Actually, he doesn't get there. He gets Genesis to Solomon. Boom. And then they kill him. But he's on his way. He takes them through the same thing that Jesus took the apostles. And the first martyr gives forth the story. If you were standing before the kings of the earth, what would you say? Well, Acts 7 is a pretty good model. It's a pretty good model. Number one, if you're going to die at the end, you might as well burn right before you die in your heart in love for Jesus. And then in the midst of it, when they begin to stone him, he's so burning. It says, Stephen and the Holy Spirit, the heavens were open and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I can just see the picture of Jesus saying, you said it well, son. You did it well, young man. Come on up. <laughs> oh, this is a methodology that I've hardly ever seen done in the church. And yet, I want to beseech you, if you get... Let me tell you what one of the most fearful things there is, is when you work up the courage, you share the gospel, and then they get saved. And then you don't know what to do with them. Has anybody ever felt that you're going, oh my gosh, they're going to backslide, and then they'll be worse than they were before? And oh, i got to do something. You run to the Christian bookstore, you pull out a hundred books, buy a thousand tape series, give them to them. Beloved, it's real simple. Open the Bible with them, starting at Genesis, and read it and tell them of Jesus. It's really that simple. And when you do, they will stay because they will meet him, the one they were made for. Okay, let's start at Genesis. Let's pray and then begin. Now my, now my title of this Message is called the sevenfold crushing of the serpent's head. Or you might call it the sevenfold display of the love of God as he crushes the serpent's head. But it's the unfolding of redemptive history. I want to do it, number one, because I just asked you to do it. And I want to do a small example of it in a very small way in the next 35 minutes. But I want to then, in the sixth wave... I want to put you and I in the story. I want to put us in the story and see where we're at. And by doing so, passion will be ignited and you will be able to understand your role in redemptive history so that when the seventh wave comes, the seventh and final crushing of the working of the enemy, beloved, we're prepared, we're ready, we're set. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Open your Bibles to Genesis. Father, we thank you. We love your name. We love your ways. 
there's none like you. We thank you that in the fullness of time, you sent your son born of a woman. We thank you that in the fullness of time, what you so enjoyed in the eternal council, we too could enjoy. Thank you that you sent him. Thank you. Thank you that you who are eternal God were made known to us. Thank you that we can observe him. Thank you that our joy can be complete as we join fellowship with the Son and the Father by the power and communion of the Spirit. Thank you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome your presence. We welcome your ministry. Open up the Word of God to us. Show us Jesus. Make his name glorious that the Father might be exalted through the Son. That God might be glorified in us and then through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 1, the story. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Made in the image of God, the story begins with a creature so lovely that God himself forms them into his own image. They're made to be the very vessels, the reflection of the image of God. There's no creature like them. In fact, they're so precious, he designs a garden just for them. He doesn't make, he doesn't make Adam in a garden. He forms Adam, breathes into him, then go, goes and makes a garden fit for such a lovely creature. Puts Adam in that garden, and then at Genesis 1.31, between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3, we have Adam in a garden. We have the bliss of communion in Eden. We have Eve being brought to Adam, blowing his mind, him prophesying, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and join himself to the woman. And the two shall become one flesh. But then something takes place between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3, a rebellion occurs. There's a rebellion, beloved. It doesn't begin on earth. It begins in the very courtrooms of heaven. You see one of the high-ranking angels, Lucifer, Satan, rebels and takes a third of the angels with him. He draws the worship to himself. He longs and craves and confuses God's glory with his glory and he begins to exalt himself. And Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 tell us that he exalted himself in his pride and said, I will ascend the mountain. I will be like God. And when he did, he took a third of the angels with him. And so in Genesis 3, our story of the fall of humanity begins where Adam and Eve are deceived by the serpent. And in that place, beloved, this is not a story just about eating some fruit and just disobeying God. They not only disobey God, they join the rebellion. They gave Satan lordship when they listened to him. It wasn't a matter of, should I do it? Should I don't? God said this. Satan did this. Beloved, there was a cosmic rebellion going on. Satan, through the serpent, brings forth deception and Eve joins the rebellion and then Adam joins the rebellion. Now in that place, several things happen. Number one, they fall from the kingdom of God. Number two, physical, spiritual, eternal death enter the picture. Number three, the sin enters the picture and the guilt of their sin and the punishment of their sin comes. And number four, All creation now begins to groan. All creation is set out of order because the image bearers, the one who were made to reflect the glory of God, now have lost that glory. They come over to the side of the evil one. That's why the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies sway underneath the power of the evil one. In the temptation... Satan, for a reason, said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Beloved, that's because he's the ruler of this world, the ruler of this age, the prince of the power of the air. 
in that place, the creation was set at odds. And then the last thing is, we were at odds with one another. Sin had come in. Social order had been disrupted. Humanity now, not only at odds with God, not only at odds with creation, but beloved, we're at odds with one another. Hear me. The nations in collective agreement will not change that reality. There's only one thing that can change social upheaval, wars and rumors of wars and jockeying and power. That is redemption and Jesus wholesale redemption across the whole earth. It's your great hope. Politics will not bring forth the answer. I'm not making a statement about politics. I'm only making a statement about there's one politician who can pull it off. That's Jesus. When he returns. He will set all things right. He will make all things new. So here we have from the very beginning, sin enters the picture. Now look with me in Genesis 4. Now we have the trouble. Here's why. In Genesis 3.15, something glorious happens, and I call this the first wave of the crushing of Satan's head. This is the first wave. This is Normandy, beloved. This is the first storm of the beach. This is getting into Europe right here. When God gives this prophecy in Genesis 3.15, everything changes for you and I. This is glorious. You have to see this. In Genesis 3, the woman and the man have just fallen. God calls Adam. Where are you, Adam? Where are you? In that place... Now the discovery, it's made, it's exposed. It's not that God didn't know, but it's brought to light. Beloved, sin will always be brought to light. What you do in the darkness, what you do in the private, it will be, and say in the private, it will be seen in the light, and it will be shouted from the rooftops. Beloved, Genesis 3 is the statement of God's commitment to justice. He will expose sin. Why? Because he wants to eradicate it. He does not want you and I to live this way forever. Beloved, that would be the worst thing imaginable if you stayed this way and I stayed this way. But he's committed out of love to make us holy. (laughs) Why? So we can finally enjoy something and enjoy it for long term. Genesis 3.15, he looks over at the girl. He sees that she's, she's been deceived. She's fallen. He calls forth the first person to account is Satan. He calls the serpent forth and he says something like this. This is the Allen Hood translation, the paraphrase, the read between the lines. Don't quote me direct. This isn't scripture, but I want to try to flesh out the statement to you. He calls the serpent over because the serpent has just deceived his most precious prize creation. The ones who were made to be the spouse for his son. And in doing so, he calls the serpent to account. I can't imagine the eyes of God as he looks at this serpent and calls him to account. And you know what he prophesies? He says, look at that little girl over there. Do you see her? You see that weak little girl that you deceived. You see that she's lost her glory. You put her under oppression and submission to another false kingdom. Your own tyrannical rule. Look at that little girl. Here's the new rules. Here's the plan of redemption. It's easy for me to crush your head, Satan. Very easy. But here's the deal. I'm going to bring forth a child from her womb that will crush your head. I'm going to bring forth a baby. See that weak little creature that you gained strategic advantage over? That you have crushed underneath oppression. Let me tell you something. That little weak little girl has a higher destiny than you can ever imagine. And you'll never take her place. For out of her loins will come forth a seed. And that seed will crush your seed. That seed will crush your head. Though you bruise his heel, he will crush your head. Oh my gosh, can you imagine the Lord of glory giving that prophecy? 
the audible voice of God saying, from the seed of woman, the booming, thunderous voice, audible voice of God, from the seed of woman shall come forth a ruler who will crush the forces of darkness. Beloved, that's the most terrifying verse in the scripture to hell. That one right there. That one right there began it all. From there, the rest of the story is the tracing of the seed. Satan is worried. There's a child coming. Promise from the loins of this girl who's going to bring forth a kingdom that will crush my kingdom. And he watches closely. And so the first thing, the strategic strike is, is to take out the seed. The two children, Cain and Abel. Have you always wondered, why did it go down that way? Here's why. Abel had favor on his life. And Satan moved to disqualify both. He got Cain to move in sin to strike Abel. Abel's dead, the favored seed, and now Cain's disqualified because of sin. Genius, right? There was more at stake there than just jealousy, beloved. Satan's watching now. He's coming after the seed. Genesis 4. What what is Adam and Eve going to do? They have another son. What is his name? Seth. And it means chosen. Appointed. Maybe this is the one. In fact, Eve says, God has given me another seed. But it doesn't come so fast. But she has another son called Enosh. You know what his name means? Frailty. She realizes this isn't going to come from the strength of man. And the next phrase is powerful. So men begin to call upon God. The first corporate prayer meeting hinted at in the whole Bible. Can you imagine a prayer meeting with Adam and Eve and Enosh and Seth and their children praying for the seed to come forth? Oh, my, my. Did you hear what I just said? Do you imagine the first corporate prayer meeting where Adam's there and Eve's there and Eve is travailing? Beloved, if you ever wondered whether Adam's and Eve are in the kingdom, don't wonder anymore. Men and women began to call upon God. They really did. You imagine Eve travailing before God. I'm so sorry. Bring forth the seed. Bring forth the seed. Bring it forth, God. Bring it forth, God. Pregnant in the prayers. The prophetic promise of Genesis 3.15. You ever felt that way? Pregnant in the promise. Wanting it so bad. It would come 4,000 years later. Genesis. From Genesis, we move on. And I'm going to do a real brief summary. Because I want to get to your part and my part. Genesis begins to unfold. God then begins in the second wave. He forms the nation of Israel. He calls Abraham out. He gives him a covenant. He says there's a seed coming. You can look it up later. Genesis 12, 15, 17, and Genesis 22, 18 is the key verse. Genesis 22, 18. I'll make these notes available on the internet. Genesis 22, 18. A seed is coming from Abraham. He passes the test with Isaac. A seed's coming. And out of that seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Now we find out. He calls out an Iraqi from Ur of Chaldea. To be the bearer of the promise of good news. He becomes the father of all nations. And the one through him will now bring forth the Messiah. How many of you have asked the question, why is Israel so important? Here's why. Jesus could only be born through one people group, beloved. Some people group, one tribe People group, ethnic persuasion had to be the bearer of the seed. That's why we honor Israel. That's why in Romans 9, Paul says, don't you know the covenant, the promises, the Messiah was brought through them. They bore the rage of Satan trying to kill the seed for 2,000 years. Honor them with your lives. Serve them that they might be provoked to come into the inheritance which they birthed. That's one of the things God is doing today. So here we have in Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22, 18. Now we have a people group. The seed. We're tracing the lineage. By Genesis 39, or I'll say it this way, by Genesis 28, 
Jacob is promised the seed again. You remember the open heaven? He's on the run from Esau. And he's worried that he's going to die. But the prophetic promise is coming through him. What's he going to do? God says, I'll tell you what, when you fall asleep, I'm going to open up the heavens and show you the resources of heaven. All the angels ascending and descending that will break the powers of darkness and make sure that my promise comes about. He gets done with Genesis 28. His seed's coming. Then we find out through Jacob, he now becomes Israel. Israel has 12 sons. You know the story, right? The 12 tribes of Israel. What tribe is now going to bring forth the seed? Genesis 49. Judah. So here we have from Abraham, from the tribe of Judah, we find out the seed is coming. Turn with me to Genesis 49, verse 10. We are going to pull this off. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, the man of peace. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now we know Judah, and Judah will lead the armies before Joshua. Now we find Genesis closes with this. Joseph has a dream in Genesis 37, and the next thing you know, all, everything goes All kinds of ways. (laughs) The summary is, everything gets thrown out of whack. And the next thing you know, what God prophesied in Genesis 15, the children of Israel are now in a foreign land under suppression. But in Exodus 3, there's going to come forth a deliverer, a prince of Egypt who happens to be an Israelite. He shall be visited in Exodus 3. And by Exodus 15, God would have bore his righteous right arm and judged Egypt and brought them out with a strong arm so they could worship him. And the song of Moses, the song of Miriam is brought forth. The horse and the rider have fallen into the sea. Who is like you, O God, among the gods? Your glorious and holiness, fearful and praises, doing wonders. And by Exodus 19, he takes them to Mount Sinai and he shakes it with his power. Trumpets go off all around them. They consecrate themselves for three days. And in that place, a cloud of fire and darkness descends upon that mountain. And God makes himself known. And they hear the voice of God. The Ten Commandments, beloved, were given by the audible voice of God. Moses would write them down later. They would encounter him. And God would then form the nation of Israel as a kingdom of priests, a special treasure. To do what? To bring forth the Messiah. To do what? To be the carriers of the promise. To do what? To be the example of God's leadership. Benevolent, kind, gracious leadership before all the nations. They would be the priestly ministry crying out night and day. Send the seed. Bring the Messiah. Bring the Messiah. And so by the time... It ends. Moses is disqualified from going into the land. Joshua takes them in. They triumph. The conquest is going, but they don't fully obey God. So some enemies are still left in the land. And at the beginning of Judges, something takes place under theocracy of God. God is leading the people. By the end of Judges, after he raises up rulers who will save them from oppression, what is the main line? It says, but the children of Israel did not have a king. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so here we have Samuel comes forth now, a prophet under the theocracy of God. And in 1 Samuel 8, write that down, 1 Samuel 8, now the people demand a king. Samuel is all upset. Samuel, is, he says, do you not know you've rejected God? They say, we want a king like the other nations to build, our, to build the armies to go out in battle. Samuel goes, a king, a human king, they'll make you pay taxes. They'll put your women in their harems. They'll make your sons fight and die for war just so they can puff their pride up. You don't want a human king. And he gets angry before them. And God says, Samuel, do not worry. I've got to play it. You see that seed they're talking about? It's not an issue of do they accept me, the theocracy, 
the king of heaven? Or do they accept a king on the earth? Because I'm going to raise up a king on the earth who happens to be the king of heaven. I'm bringing them together. I'm going to do something that's going to blow your mind, Samuel. They've not rejected you. They've rejected me, Samuel. But I've got an ace up my sleeve called the incarnation. (laughs) Oh, this is amazing. When you begin to see the story unfold, beloved, we read it as if past tense. Oh, yeah, that that was just, yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, the God man makes sense. To who? Who does it make sense to? Samuel was undone. So their first attempt at a king, Saul, becomes the model of what not to be. In his own strength, he attempts to rule. But David, turn with me to 2 Samuel 7. We're getting there. 2 Samuel 7. God promises to David. He finds a man after his own heart, faithful in the house of God. A man who served his highest purposes in his generation. And David becomes a picture of two things. As the lineage, as the seed is being traced, now we know from 2 Samuel 7 that it will not only come through Abraham, the seed, it will not only come through the tribe of Judah, it will come through the house of David. And his government shall never end. There shall always be a king from the house of David on the throne. Look what it says. When your days are fulfilled, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And it ends with 16. And your house, but your house, well, let's go to 15, because it's too good in the prophets, the mercy, the sure mercies of David. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now turn with me. So here we have, well, two things. David's house, he does two things. God says, it's going to be through your house that the seed's coming, the God man. It's going to be through your house, David. That's why David would get those Psalms, Psalm 110, and go, the Lord said to my Lord, (laughs) by the Spirit, David's soul, the Lord of glory, he's going to be both God and man as a king. Bringing heaven and earth together goes, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. He gets the promise. And number two, he sets up a tabernacle, a foreshadowing of worship. He removes the veil from from where the Ark of the Covenant is. And he puts singers around it. And they stare at the glory over the mercy seat. And it's a foreshadowing of the day when the Ark of the Covenant won't be divided from the people because of sin. When the Ark of the Covenant, the glory over the mercy seat, shall be with the people of God. In fact, shall be in them. And David sees this and prophesies all throughout the Psalms. I wish we had time for the Psalms. We don't. Psalm 2, Psalm 72. Oh, beloved, Psalm 45. They're just all over the place. David, seeing as the picture of the coming Messiah, seeing Jesus who's to come, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. He sees his Lord. The heavens. I believe actually he was staring at the glory over the mercy seat many times when the hand of the Lord came heavy upon him and visions were opened up and he began to pin. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples of the earth plot? plot Actually, he was probably prophesying and somebody else was scribing it. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples of the earth plot a vain thing? Oh, the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. He holds them in derision because they want to throw off his chains and fetters. Oh, but I've set my king on Zion. Oh, I've set him. (laughs) And he shall ask of me. And I shall give him the nations as his inheritance. The ends of the earth as his possession. He will dash them with an iron rod like pieces of pottery. Oh, be wise, you kings. (laughs) David's prophesying oh this king that's coming you better get with the program you kings and judges he's God in the flesh turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9 
The prophets begin to build on this Davidic covenant. They begin to see it more clearly. A king's coming who would fulfill the promises of Abraham. Who would fulfill the promises of David, a human king on a throne who would bring redemption. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall accomplish this. Isaiah. Oh, if we had time. Isaiah. He sees the millennial reign in Isaiah 2 of this king and his kingdom. Isaiah 7. He now, well, Isaiah 4, he now finds out the king of that kingdom's going to come as a man. And then he finds out in Isaiah 7, he's going to come as a baby. And then in Isaiah 9, he finds out the baby's God. Isaiah 11, then he finds out he's both the root shooting out, the shoot out of the stump of Jesse, the branch that will grow out, and he's actually the root, Isaiah eleven eleven. Now, Isaiah has to be totally confused. Which is he? You can't be both the branch of the tree and the root of the tree. Which is he? And God says, yes. He's the branch and the root. What do you mean? Well, John the Baptist said it best. There's one who came after me who's preferred before me. Because he was before me. John, what are you and Isaiah smoking? Did he come after you or before you? Yes. He who came after me, he came before me. And I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. I baptize with water, but beloved, he's from heaven. A man can only receive what comes from heaven. I testify of things of the earth. But there's one who's coming from heaven who's going to tell us about Abba, Father. He's going to tell us of heavenly things. In fact, he's going to be God in the flesh. He will destroy the works of the devil. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. Love it. This is your story. It's worth everything you have. It's worth everything you are. It's worth living for. It's worth dying for. It's as passionate as it gets. He has the sevenfold spirit on him. Oh, we can't do Isaiah. Oh, go to Jeremiah 33. I'm sorry, Isaiah. I feel bad. <laughs> he has the sevenfold spirit on him. He'll change the ecology. Even children, even a little child, will put his hand in the serpent in the cobra's den. Ask somebody about India about cobra's dens. A little child, he'll change the ecology. The wolf and the lamb shall lay down together. A child shall lead the bear. A young child shall take a bear and say, come on. The little child will reach in and grab the cobra and say, yeah, yeah, here it is, mama. The predators, they'll eat grass. But we, we don't have any understanding of when Jesus returns, what he's going to do to ecology, to physiology, to biology, to zoology. Believe he's going to change it all. Why? He's the creator. All things were made through him and for him and by him. He holds all things together by the power of his being. The very image, the radiance of the Father's glory in your frame. The very gift to us to touch. Beloved, do you know what? God is spirit. But God the Son is flesh and blood and you can touch him. 
What did John say to the Gnostics who said he only appeared in the flesh? He said, absolutely not. You're the Antichrist spirit. If you say Jesus didn't come in the flesh, you're an Antichrist. We touched him. We heard him. We seen him. Oh, and what we've seen, our lips testify to you. That we have fellowship with the Father and his Son. Oh, I tell you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Turn with me to Luke 1. You can read Genesis 33 on your own. The branch of the Lord, Zechariah 6. The branch of the Lord, Daniel 2. A stone shall be honed out of the mountain, not by men's hands, that will crush the image of the, the, of the, the picture of all the kingdoms of this age. He'll grind them to dust. And that little stone... That man, Christ Jesus, will grow up and fill all the earth and he will have an everlasting kingdom and it shall never end. Turn to Luke 1. Here's the next wave. We'll do this quickly. Luke 1. The incarnation. The third wave, I call it. You want to talk about the third wave? <laughs> you know, the vineyard movement. That, uh, the third wave of the gospel. That third wave, the incarnation. God comes in the flesh. Beloved, the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his, and, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Mary said, how can this be? I don't know a man. <laughs> For Gabriel has such, he has the best job. I mean, he really does. I, I read the angels. Michael's got to go into it. But Gabriel gets to tell all the good stuff. Shows up. I can see him smiling. It says that angels long to look into these things. What was it like for Gabriel to speak things that were so high and lofty? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he throws in a little thing. I mean, that is, that is so big. Then he goes, oh, also Elizabeth is pregnant too. She's pregnant. I mean, as if that's, that's higher than the other one. It's like, it's, oh, and Elizabeth's pregnant. She goes, how can that be? She's barren. She goes, he says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, he has, she has no idea what he just said there. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Genesis 3.15 is going to take place through you. See, it came through Abraham's promise. Judah's tribe, David's house, and Mary's loins. This one little, one little gal. For that reason, I'm going to say it again, but I just want, in case there's any pastors here, I'm never saying one bad word about Mary ever, ever. Never, 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 never. Never. You know why? It's Jesus' mama. I don't want to meet him one day, and he says, you know what, Alan, that, that, that was some really good teaching. You know, pretty good. Except I, I, I want to know one thing. Uh, what'd you say about my mom? <laughs> I'll leave that to the anti papas I'm not going there. She's found favor. God brings her forth, a child out of Mary. Look, let's turn to Luke 3. Now. The inauguration of the Messianic mission begins. Beloved, let me tell you, when the incarnation happened, there's a reason why Satan was trying to kill the baby Jesus. Trying to prevent everything that was to happen. When God took on your form, it secured redemption at a whole nother level. When God took on your form, it's a statement before all the cosmos God has thrown his chips in with us. God has taken on our frame. He has linked himself to us in a unique way. Beloved, he didn't come to same angels 
angels that fell, he didn't take on their form and redeem them. But we fail. The prize creatures. You're struggling with your, 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 your quiet time and you think God is so mad at you. Beloved, when you were at your worst, God came after you, took on your frame and fought for you unto death. He can help you. Fellowship with His Spirit. Ask Him for help. He will get you there. Anyone, God who can take on flesh and redeem us, or God who can take on flesh and just not blow up the body that He took on, is able to bring you through your quiet time. He's able to give you grace. The God who can put on a little 18 to 21 inch Seven to eight pound little baby. And not blow it up. That's like planting an, uh, a, what are those things called? A red, a red tree? What are they called? Redwood tree or a massive oak tree and a little one inch flower pot. And it holding in it. Actually, that's such an understatement. God in the flesh. And you don't think he can help you out of your anger problem? Or your temptation towards fornication? Or lust? Or covetousness? Are you kidding me? Do you know the story? He can do this easy. That's why the New Testament writers, after they understood the incarnation... The death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, they went. He can do anything. He's faithful to complete what he started. Beloved, then God would release in Luke 3 the baptism of Jesus. The open heavens would come. The Spirit would come upon him. And he would begin to destroy the works of the devil. And in Luke 4, the Spirit. Oh, I wish we had time to talk about the Spirit's relationship to Jesus. He brought him forth in conception. He then, he then raises him and instructs him at the age all the way up to the time when he's revealed at the baptism, when John baptizes him. The heavens open. He hears the voice, you're, you're my beloved son. And now the Spirit leads him into the wilderness for a fight. And the Word made flesh after 40 days of fasting. The Word, the living Word, quotes the written Word Against the most wicked evil being. Could you imagine what that's like? This isn't like a Bible study and Satan's tempting him. You know, hey, I'd like to get you to do this. And Jesus goes, wait, where's that verse? No. Right here, read it. Jesus had been absorbing the word. The living word at the age of 12 was in his father's house doing his father's business. Absorbing the word. Feasting on the word, eating the scroll, and now after the spirit came on him, fully God, fully man, with, with the spirit without measure, he goes into the wilderness, and 40 days in, his spirit sharp, and all of a sudden, the evil one comes to him and tries to entice him, and Jesus says, Satan, it is written. Beloved, those weren't just little Bible quotes. That was like a sledgehammer, just... Now, the wondrous thing is, it was a man quoting that under the anointing. Young men, 1 John says, if you want to learn how to overcome the evil one, eat the scroll, commune with the Spirit, and then when he comes to you, you quote that word and you hit him with everything that word's got. Young men, young men, you've overcome the evil one by the word. And Jesus binds the strong man. He tells his disciples. He comes out of that wilderness. Angels strengthen him. And it's like a blitzkrieg. He just dominates all of Palestine. He binds the strong man. And the finger of God comes. And he casts out devils. And whoever wants to be healed gets healed. Whoever touches his him even gets healed. Open heavens. And then in the fullness of time. When it's just at his perfect peak. John 12. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it can produce no fruit. And the Father speaks from heaven and says, I will glorify my name through you, Jesus, when the Son of Man is lifted up. 
I will draw all peoples to myself. And the ruler of this world will be judged. And in his weakest moment, when the devil thinks he's winning, he crucifies the Lord of glory. The general of generals says, it's nice that I'm bringing the power of God to the planet, but I'm about to put the power of God in them. I want to save them forever. I don't want to be with them just now. There's one problem. The disciples had anointing, but they were still going to hit the grave at 90 miles an hour and never get out. So Jesus, the general of generals, takes away the one weapon that Satan has, and that's the guilt of sin. And the general of generals sizes up the battlefield, and he picks the high ground, and he puts himself on a cross, and he dies for their sin, and he asks the Father to forgive them. (laughs) And he crushes the head of the serpent by his own blood. And God the Father pours out his wrath upon the Son. And God himself, the substitutionary atonement, bears his own wrath against sin as he pours it out on Jesus. And now the innocent one (laughs) takes your punishment and my punishment. And at the same moment, God displays how far he'll go to save you and I. Isn't that brilliant? And Satan, you can hear the screams as every blood drop hits the ground. Righteous. Righteous in the spirit. Hebrews 9, 14 offers up that sacred blood in the eternal courts of heaven, the eternal sanctuary. And now, you and I, if we believe, will never die. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be the righteousness of God. Beloved, what kind of love is this that God pursued us for 4,000 years and in the fullness of time died for you and me? What kind of love is this? And then to ensure our victory, he rose from the dead and conquered death. And then he took his human body right up into the courts of heaven and sat at the right hand of God and now pours out the very spirit that filled him without measure. And now the ones who were oppressed get to beat up on the bully on the block. Do we know what we have? From the book of Acts on, The power of God begins to spread. The kingdom of God is with men. Now here's our story and here's why I'll leave it. Turn with me to Revelation 12. Actually, Revelation 4 and 5. I'm going to sum it up this way. Because there's coming another wave. See, there's a prayer and worship movement that's beginning all over the earth. And it is the most dangerous assault to the kingdom of darkness. You see, God, it was easy for God to defeat Satan, but God wanted to defeat him through us. What does Romans 16 say? The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath whose feet? Our feet. Why? Because he picked a fight with a little girl back in a garden who happened to be the special creature made for God. And now he's going to vindicate everything. Redemption is the story of God and it's the story of us. It's beautiful. It's lovely. If you don't know him today, I invite you. Don't wait. Let the games begin now. You'll never regret it. He'll fill you with his spirit. You'll experience forgiveness. If right now you're in habitual sin, right now turn to the one who became a little baby who died on the cross, who rose again, who now, by by sitting at the right hand of God, pours out the Spirit. He's able to help you in your time of need. Trust me. He's able. Turn to Him again. Fellowship with the Spirit. Gaze upon Jesus. He's just like the Father. We close it with this. If I had time, Revelation 4 and 5. 
a new wave begins. The end of the age scenario begins to be executed by Jesus. And it gets executed through this elders and living creatures holding up a harp and a bowl. It's the worship and the prayers of the saints. You see, right now all over the earth, God is bringing forth the most powerful weapon against Satan, and that is the prayer and worship of the saints who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we join with heaven, heaven and earth unite, something dramatically happens. I don't have time. We ran out of time. Something dramatically happens in Revelation 4 and 5. All the job descriptions begin changing. The living creatures who never quit saying, holy, 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 after the prayers and worship of the saints arise, they actually do. And they actually begin to announce the temporal judgments of God. When Revelation 4 and 5 happens, the worship of the saints ascends. Revelation 12 ticks off. Michael and his arch- Michael the archangel and his angels cast Satan down. And now a worldwide open heaven begins where the saints move in unhindered authority and power like they've never known. As the accuser is cast down and the trial of their life begins, but they overcome that trial by the word of their testimony and what? The blood of the Lamb. And they didn't love their lives unto death. He meets that little girl again, beloved. And she's not so easy this time. She'll go to her grave before she eats that fruit. And in that day, she begins to release the greatest judgments against the kingdom of darkness ever known. And from that time on in the book of Revelation, the prayer movement, Revelation 7, actually Revelation 6, as she's dying, The martyrs are dying in the sixth seal, the fifth seal. A prayer movement breaks forth and God rips open the heavens and lashes out and starts to destroy the kingdom of darkness. In Revelation 8, God silences all of heaven and says, listen to the prayers of the saints. And then they release the judgments of God. In Revelation 15, we're singing. Oh, on the sea of glass to prepare For the coming of Jesus. Oh beloved. That's where you and I are at right now. It's a good time to get a vision of him isn't it? It's a good time to start joining in the worship and prayer isn't it? Why? It's our story. Let's just pray together. Stand up. I just want to pray Luke 24 over you. Luke 24 45. 